I'd like to ask you a question. Who, on their wedding day, was perfect at hitting the mark? Who was perfect at knowing exactly what to do to hit the mark for their spouse on how to care for their spouse? Anybody here? No one. Not even myself. Right? We're not perfect at hitting the mark. And so today we're going to be talking to you guys about how you can communicate how to hit the mark even better. All right, so I've got little props I want to show you. Which one do you think is easiest to learn? This one? You're right. I think so, too. This is like dating. You just have to take a ball and you go, there you go. <laughs> it's not that hard to learn. It's throwing a ball. And with dating, what do we do? We go out on a date. We try to care for each other and protect each other. We're at our best when we go on a date, correct? Then we go home. And we're not with the person all the time. And so we have independent skills as well. But when we get married, all of a sudden, it doesn't, it's not easy anymore, is it? It's changed. Our whole target has changed. And what we once were good at, all of a sudden we have to learn a whole set of other habits or behaviors. And so I'm going to have Pastor Dennis and Nett come up. And they are going to show, show you how to do this. Now, at first, when you get married, I'm going to give this to you. And you can go where Phil is. Pastor Dennis, when you got married, were you an expert? No. And so you just sort of tried to meet her needs. Well, he's awesomely close. We didn't practice because I wanted him to go way off because that's usually what happens, right? Everybody, they do the things that they think they're going to like, but it's not really what their spouse likes. And so usually what happens is a spouse is just happy that their husband or wife is trying, and they're, just not, they're quiet about it. Okay, I see some of you guys nodding your heads, right? Because at least your spouse is trying and you need to accept that. Well, the problem is, here Dennis is trying to care for, for Nett in a very specific way, but he's not hitting the mark. And most people, when they just start something new, they're way out here. So do you see a lot of energy is put into trying to hit the mark? but it's not hitting the mark. You're, you're expending energy, you're expending resources, but it's not doing anything to affect the love bank. So some of you have already talked about the I'd love it if statement. And I'm going to have Net do some I'd love it ifs for a need of affection. And she's going to show you what happens visually when we start telling our spouse, or suggesting to our spouse, I should say, ways on how to hit the mark. We call it the gift of honesty, but it's also part of what I teach people is how to be specific, and we're gonna be practicing that today, by the way, specific on how to share how to meet your needs. Whoops, I'm sorry. So, Nett, could you please go up to him and with every I love it if, bring him closer. For my need of affection, honey, I'd love it if, you could give me a 10 second hug this tight whenever you come home from work. Now, we're gonna bring Pastor Dennis a little closer. Now, do another one. Honey, I love it if you will tell me or say I love you when you wake up and when we sleep. Okay, do you guys, are you guys hearing the specific 
All right? I want you to understand that. Now, you who are Forgus of Love graduates, you know what I mean by specific, but you are not. Listen to those that it's specific things that's going to get him closer to hitting the mark. One more. Honey, I'd love it if you would text me during the day and tell me that you miss me and you're thinking about me. Okay? So we're going to go so close that, look it. Wow! Good job, Pastor Dennis. Look it. Hitting the mark perfectly. All right. I want you to see that this is a good example of what we're trying to do with a phrase that I'm going to be teaching you. But we're going to first talk about emotional needs a little bit because that is what is part of the care. Now, we already talked about how to be a source of happiness and that care is that willingness and effort to do what you can to be a source of happiness. So you see, Net gave Pastor Dennis some specific ways that he can care and he had a willingness and an effort to do, and he got closer to actually hitting the mark and depositing loads of love units. That's how it works. And so an emotional need, let me review these with you. This is a craving that when it's satisfied, it leads the person to be happy and content. And when it's un unsatisfied, you're unhappy and, and discontent. There are thousands of emotional needs, but there are particular ones that when met in marriage will trigger romantic love. When we do them for our spouse, it's going to make big deposits. The emotional needs in marriage, affection, domestic support, family commitment, honesty and openness, sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, attractive spouse, financial support, admiration, appreciation, and intimate conversation. Hmm. Okay. Do you see? Those are, the, those are the categories. And by the way, you can have other categories. But these are the ones that my father back in the 1970s realized these tend to be the categories within marriage that people want the most. Not only that, there's certain categories, there's certain emotional needs that husbands tend to like versus women. And so I'm not going to tell you what are the tend to be because I would want you to figure them out. They're very different individually. So what do we do? We ask spouses to ask each other to identify their five top emotional needs. Out of those 10, pick five. Not that they are missing in your marriage, this is an important point, but that these are the most important for you. They make you feel the best. And so you pick that. Net picked the need for affection. And then she gave specific I love it is for affection. So what we're going to do is we're going to be practicing I love it if and whens with each other. I love it if when, because that helps you specifically hit the mark. Now, when I first, let me give you a little bit of background. Some of you may not know this, who even took the class. But when I first started my counseling uh, marriage coaching career, it was back in the 1990s. What I learned in my counseling classes was what's called an I feel message. It was, I feel frustrated when you put your chair like that because I think the chair should go this way. And so everyone was trying to learn this type of phrasing and teaching it. Well, when I was working with troubled marriages, because remember, the marriages that came to me were the ones that basically said, when they came to me on Wednesday, they said on Friday, they're planning to divorce. They're that hurting. And so when I would start using, teaching them the I feel message, it created chaos. You're thinking, why? 
all it is is telling a feeling, right? For some reason, it doesn't work. Now, with healthy marriages, it could work because you can get away with a lot of things if you're a healthy marriage. But if you're a real hurting marriage, you have to say it in a different way. And then what I found out is even if you're a healthy marriage, saying in this way is comfortable as well. Okay? So I decided to, sit, to try to teach them a phrase that was about love, meaning a loving relationship. They're in a loving relationship, or they, I wanted them to be in a loving relationship. And I wanted them to say what specifically they needed. Not a general, but a specific. All right? Not what they don't want, but what they do want. Let me just ask you, what do you like to hear better? If you're driving up to Tagaytay and you're, you're starting a conversation and your spouse says, I'd love it if you wouldn't talk about that topic. That's option number one. Option number two is, I'd love it if we could talk about another topic. Which one do you prefer? Second one, right? You want to know the direction. You want to know the specific desired behavior, if you can. And then, specifically. So it's not a general. I'd love it if you would be nice to me. Could nine out of 10 people know exactly what that meant? No, that doesn't give direction again. The other reason why I taught the I love it if is remember, I'm working with these couples that are way low in the love bank. They're in the red. And if I, I needed to get them rocket boosted very fast into love because they didn't have patience. They didn't have time. They needed to go quickly. They needed to make deposits quickly. And so by telling specifically how to make, hit the mark, it might be a little prescribed. It might be a little bit odd. It might be not the way love stories are. But remember, I try to get people from down here to up there. And what I realize is even people that are in love can respond well to hearing those comments. And some of you, again, you might have realized the I'd love it if feels funny. To say I'd love it if feels funny. But shoot, we say a lot of funny things, right? And we speak different languages, and it feels funny at first. But eventually, it becomes part of your way of speaking. All right? So why love? Why not I like it if? Why not I appreciate it if? People ask all the time, and I know you'd probably ask it in our Q&A, so I'm going to tell you. When you say I'd love it if, what kind of relationship are you wanting with your spouse? A love relationship. And when you are sharing this with your spouse, you are giving them a gift of love. And when their spouse meets the need, in that particular way, they are giving you the gift of care. That's part of love. So I'm telling you, please, 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 use love. And if you want to translate into a different dialect or something like that, stay with the love, OK? Because it's different. Everybody else, you can say, I like it, I appreciate it. But with your spouse, Use love. It's a reminder that you're in a love relationship, please. Now, I must say, though, just try the I love it if with your children. It's amazing. A lot of people, they say to me, they have generalized this phrase to other people. And I must tell you, now, I don't recommend this to everybody and only to same gender. But when I am in a conflict with a customer service person, it's very easy for me to start getting a little bit, I need, I want, this is, this is how you should be doing it. I have trained myself to use I'd love it if. I'd love it if we could do this. How do you feel about this? I'm telling you, it works great. 
So if you want to just practice it this weekend or this time, this day, I, I tell you, it's a wonderful thing. We're going to be practicing it right now. The I'd love it if. I'm going to share a little example. This is really funny, actually. Phil and I were teaching a Four Gifts of Love class. And if anyone knows me very well, I like coffee with a lot of cream. And I used to like a lot of sugar. And so that's the way I always had coffee. Well, we were at a Four Gifts of Love class. And I said, sweetie, you know, I'd love you to give me some coffee. And it was black coffee. Black! We've been married 25 years. You think he wouldn't know how I made coffee, right? And I could have easily said, black coffee? And in front of everybody, I could have done this. Don't you know me? How long have we been married? What's wrong with you? Nope. Tomorrow you're going to learn to protect from love busters, which I did. Automatically, what came out of my mouth was, I'd love it if, sweetie, you can get me some cream with two packs of sugar. Guess what? He did it. Guess what? He hit the mark. It's that easy. Right? Now, again, these aren't demands. Now, see, if he said, you know, I can't get it right now, and then if I'd punch him in the stomach for not getting it, that'd be a love buster. But it was offered as a suggestion, and he gave it to me. That's what I'd love it if is. Now, just want you to know about this. I don't want you giving any personal examples. But I want you to start working your brain to be thinking about how to say this for that particular need. Okay, we got uh, admiration, right? Admiration. So uh, an example is I'd love it if every time after I preach, you say that I did really well. So every time, and really well, so there. Even if it, I bumped. You know? <laughs> good. And I'm going to even add, I'd love it if you would give me three things that you really loved about my sermon. Do you see? That's even more specific, right? Okay. I just want to warn you, to remind you guys, this is not instinctive. This does not come to us naturally. This is something that has to be developed in you as a skill. And it is hugely effective. All right, so we're going to go to our next, next group. All right, now what was yours? Uh, I love it whenever you tell me that I'm beautiful in front to other people. I love it when you... Whenever you say I'm beautiful in, in front of other people. I love I love it when you admire me or appreciate me in front of other people. Like, like, wow, isn't my husband amazing? He's so handsome. <laughs> like that? Yeah. Okay. yeah. See? Yeah. And it's like bullseye right in the That's mark. That's a number right? 10 right there. Good job. All right. Now we have financial support. How do you do an I'd love it if for financial support? We, we chose the work hours. Yes. So one of the example is, I love it when you come home early. Okay, when you come home early. All right, let me just add on to this a little bit. I'd love it if you would be regularly home by five. But if you can't, I'd love it if you would text me that you're going to be a little late. Did you guys see what I just, what happened? All right? And bullseye. And then furthermore, you could say, I'd love it if you'd put a cell phone alarm on your, your phone so that it would remind you to come home at this time. Yep. Okay? So you chose time for financial support or work hours. All right? That is, that is part of financial support. Okay, and let's keep going. You guys are getting good at this. You're good. All right, which one do you guys have? This one is a toughie. Physical attractiveness. Right? 
How do we share that with a spouse that we have a need without being disrespectful? Do you guys want to try this one out? What's an I'd love it if for physical attractiveness? I, I love it if you are always sexy and beautiful. Okay. <laughs> All right, I love that as a start. But how many of you know what sexy is? How many of you know what beautiful is? He knows what it is, but he has to be able to share specifics. All right, specifics. So he could say, I'd love it if I can show you what I really love for you to wear when we're on a date. I'd love it if we'd be able to go through your closet and I show you what I love that I think is sexy and beautiful that I would love for you to wear. Right? Do you see that? This isn't what comes from us instinctively, but I'm telling you, it is the most effective way of talking. And if even in this whole rest of this day, I want you to start thinking about how are you going to be restating things and being honest. This is a gift of honesty. And don't you want to be spending your energy hitting the mark? You're going to be appreciating this honesty. All right. This table has domestic support. So, sir, what do you have to uh, I'd love it if you could cook at least one dinner a week. I'd love it if you'd cook one dinner a week. Now, how can you get even more specific? You can say, I love adobo, and I love curry chicken. You can actually give some specifics. But don't you love that? That one day a week, I'd love it if you would make the dinner for us. All right, let's do another one. This takes practice. Let's see, which one was yours? Domestic support. Okay, this table had domestic support. Let's hear what they say. Come on. <laughs> I'd love it if you'll help with the folding and organizing of the washed clothes. I heard somebody then add every day. Right? I heard every day. I'd love it if you would help with the folding and the washing clothes every day. And you could even go further and you could say, I'd love it if every day after we have our dinner that we would do the dishes together and then we would fold and wash clothes together. Yeah. Okay, we haven't done this one yet. Family commitment. Family commitment. Let's see about this one. I'd love it if you can spend three hours each day with our kids during weekdays and six hours during weekends. That's very specific. Now, I'm going to even go a little bit further. What do you want to do during that time? So, you know, that if, I, if my spouse gave me that, I would say, what would you like me to do during that time? And then the answer would be, I'd love it if you would help them with their um, Bible study or, you know, read Bible with them. You know, like I, 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 I'd love it if you'd play basketball with them. I'd love it if you would, you know, and so she would give or he would give specific things to do in those times, okay? But I, I love that. That's very specific. All right. What is yours? Honesty and openness. Honesty and openness. All right. What do you have for that one? I'd love it if, you, if you'll rate my cooking from scale of one to five Ooh. without asking, without me asking it first every time I cook. Now, did you notice she used a one to five scale, which I'm going to teach you again tomorrow. Are you, are you guys a graduate? I think so, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, because I love the one to five scale. Instead of saying, I don't like it, or it's okay, right, or I'm okay with that, you say, that's a three. And again, hitting the mark. So say you've been, you spend three hours cooking something and you've been thinking that you're hitting the mark, 
And finally, the person is honest and open and says, that's a three or a two. Guess what? You can cook something else. All right, so what's your need? Physical attractiveness. And like I say, this is a toughie on how to do the specific I'd love it if that's not something that's going to hurt the person, right? You have to be very careful with this. And what's your I'd love it if? All right, you... You're being pointed to. Okay. Okay. I'd love it if you exercise with me at least once a week for one hour. I learned from everyone. <laughs> All right. I'd love it if you'd exercise once a week with me. Absolutely. I love that. All right. So what do you guys have? Since I'm back here, you guys have... <laughs> What you have? Physical. You have physical attractiveness too. Okay, so can you guys have never been to the class? So what's your I love it if? Do you have one? Uh, I'd love it if you would wear more colorful clothes <laughs> when we are in the house and even when we are out, what? as it would make us feel younger. <laughs> oh, I love it. He chose color. Isn't that great? My teacher's heart is, is pounding so hard. I'm so happy. All right. Now we got another table. What, what need do we have? Family, Family commitment. commitment. So I'd love it if we can have a monthly, regular family activity outside home. Focused, no, technolo no phones. Yeah. I love it. Is that pretty specific, isn't it? I love it if Good once job. a month we'd have a family activity where there's no phone. Right? That is a not, I must admit. Okay, that is a not. Um, I'm going to tell you how to say that without a not. Electronic free. All right? I'd love it if we would be electronic free. That is staying with the knots. Don't, don't do the knots. All right, so what is your need? Honesty and openness. I love it if you tell more details about the trip with your friend. I'd love it if you'd give me more details about your trip, or I'd love it if you give me more details about your work day, and you could even go specifically. I'd love it if you'd give me three positive things that happened to your day. I'd love it if you'd give me one good thing, bad thing about your day. You see? All right, exactly. I love to hear three details about, about what you're learning in Bible study. Do you guys get this? And what's so fun is that when you start doing it, be thinking about the love bank. Every time you do one of these specific behaviors, you're hitting the bullseye. You're hitting the bullseye. Again, this is very new for you. And even those who have taken the class, even those who facilitate the class, it's new for you. It's still sometimes hard for Phil and I. Sometimes I get out of the habit. And I must admit, you don't have to say I'd love it if for every single thing. When it comes to an emotional need, I love it if specific, positive, objective, nine out of 10 people can follow it. Got it? And so, encourage you to keep trying it. It is quite the eye-opener, and it will help your relationship a lot in hitting the mark. All right. The four intimate emotional needs come with a warning. These are the emotional needs of affection, sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, and intimate conversation. These needs deposit the most love units in the love bank. So what does that mean? It means it's a great thing to know when you're married, right? Because you know what to focus on too. Like when you go on a date, be thinking of focusing on these behaviors because they meet the most important emotional needs. They are they're the ones that deposit the most love units, but they come with a warning. I didn't show you this, but my little bullseye up here hardly had any instructions. 
<laughs> Matter of fact, I was putting it together when we first bought it. And I said, shoot, can't figure it out. And it took me several times to figure it out. Finally, I looked at the back of it, and it has these three pictures. And it's like, dang, why didn't I look at it? You know, it was so simple. But it wasn't very simple. They think it's easy, but even just putting the, the little piece on the bow, that was hard, too. It took some effort. You know what it came with? Warnings. The only sheet of paper were warnings. <laughs> Sometimes we need warnings for these needs. They're great in marriage, but if you are affectionate, if you have intimate conversation, if there's recreational companionship, sexual thoughts with somebody else of the opposite gender, what is, if you do that regularly, what's going to happen? Love you to deposits. Ka-chink, ka-chink. So say I was talking to somebody else and hugs and all this to somebody else. I may not even be affected, but I am messing with that person's love bank. My account in that person's love bank will be increasing. So even though that person may not be doing many things back to me, I'm messing with them. I'm messing with their, their heart and their head and their relationship. Because now I have, I'm becoming a competing love bank. That's a problem with, <laughs> I used to say that's a problem with Christians. That is a problem with a lot of nice people. Is we want to care for people. And we want to care for people in specific ways. I'm a counselor. I see where people have needs. It's very easy for me to be empathetic and yearn to care for them. But guess what? I have a rule. My rule is I take the warning seriously. Those are exclusive needs to my husband. They are met exclusively with him. That is my promise. And that is his promise to me. That intimate conversation is only done with me. Affection is only done with me. Our recreational companionship is only done with me. Now, he does go out sometimes with Barkada, and I go out with friends, and sometimes my girlfriends were affectionate. In the Philippines, I actually learned how to be affectionate because, you know, you guys all hug each other, and so now I'm a hugger. And I sometimes do it with guys, too, but it's not regular, and I'm, I'm very conscious of it. I'm very conscious that there was a kachink. And so what happens, though, and this is where I'm giving you an extra little, sorry about this warning, but this is from my heart. Phil and I, when we first started the Four Gifts of Love class, this class was mainly to be helping pastors not succumb to an affair. That was our, our heart. And so we wanted to train as many pastors because about, um, well, many years ago, I worked with a pastor, and he had an affair with a worship leader, which sadly is a common story, you know? And what happened? They were meeting for coffee. It was a slow cook. Neither one of them said, I want to have an affair. But slowly but surely, love units were deposited until one day, he actually said to me, this is a pastor with nine, nine years of so many experience, evangelical church. He said, I think God put this person in my life. Whoa. We call that the fog, right? Because they're not seeing that God did not put this person in your life. And that had you been doing the same things with your wife, your legacy and everything would be so amazing. 
Well, it caused the destruction of his, his whole family. Two years I worked with the wife, two years to wait for this affair to die its natural death. That's sort of a strategy that I take certain times if the woman is willing to wait. Two years, three months, the affair died. But at the two-year mark, she divorced him. He is now a painter today. And I'm not talking about an artist painter. I'm talking about a painter of walls. Nine years of experience, seminary experience. For what? Well, that's why Phil and I are so dedicated to helping you guys have the most amazing marriage you can have. And not only that, because see, the problem is you can still have a very good marriage, but if you're not protecting those needs with somebody else, you can develop an emotional love feeling for that person, another person. And I'm telling you, that path is a path to feeling hell on earth. It's the most horrible thing. It hurts everybody around you, trust me. That's why my father and I, we wrote Surviving an Affair, not because it was any of our personal experiences, but just because 90% of the people that we work with are surviving in fidelity. And what's amazing, though, and we never imagined it, is that those people that went through hell, we have helped them get to a feeling of love and to protect their marriage. So, I mean, it, it's repairable, but I'm way into prevention. The Four Gifts of Love class is way about prevention. So that's why, again, if you're facilitators, I, I'm sorry I have a broken record. I'm even going to every table saying, take this class, take this class, take this class. Why? There's nothing in it for me if you take the class, really. It's free. <laughs> I just want you to take it because I love you, each one of you. And I want you to have the most amazing love relationship with your spouse, and I want you to be in romantic love with your spouse. All right, so what is affection? Affection is the craving for non-sexual expression of extraordinary care through words, cards, gifts, kisses, hugs, and courtesies. It expresses all care for you and protect you. I'm concerned about your problems. I'll help you overcome them. Affection is not sex but it does provide the necessary environment for sex. So if you notice what Nett was saying, for her I'd love it is for hitting the mark. She used affection. I asked her to come up with I'd love it is for affection. And if you notice what she did was she showed him the kind of touch she liked. I like a 10 second hug like this. And so she showed him what she likes. And so part of affection for the I'd love it ifs would be along that line as well. All right, the need for sexual fulfillment is a craving for sexual experiences that are predictably enjoyable and frequent. Spouses should teach each other the facts about their own sexual reactions and how they are triggered. Men and women are different, guys. You people, you probably already know that. There's different ways of triggering those feelings, and your job is to figure those out. Three requirements, and it's not only for sexual fulfillment that these are requirements, but it's for the other needs as well, but especially within sexual fulfillment. The quality, how is it done? How specifically are you going to be behaving? The quantity, how often? And this is one, it's huge. Mutuality. Meeting, the need, meeting any of the needs is not about feeling pain when you're giving it. If I said to Phil, by the way, this wouldn't be what I would say because I don't like shopping, but if I said to him, I'd love it if you'd shop with me 10 hours on Saturday. How many of you would feel pain if you shop for 10 hours? Guys especially, I would feel pain even with that one. But there wouldn't be mutuality if he said okay. Because he'd be feeling that that's a one out of five. And so then he can come back and negotiate with me. 
And that's another thing that we teach in the class is how to negotiate these. And he might say, well, I wouldn't mind an hour. How about an hour? I'd say, yeah, I'd love that too. And then he'd say, that's about a four. And especially if we go to the sports shop and get a cute bullseye and we can start practicing this together, that's even better. Or if we can shop going to the grocery store or if we could shop online. Do you see? Mutuality. Both people have to be happy. Now, again, they're different needs for different people. So even though he's shopping, he may not be going, woohoo, but it's still something that he'd be willing to do. The policy of sexual exclusivity. Interestingly, our daughter, she just graduated with her uh, PsyD, which is like a PhD in psychology. Her dissertation was a very unusual one. It was on pornography and male sexual satisfaction. How's that for a dissertation? Guess what the outcome was? Even if the person had years of past pornography experience, just by stopping by one month, the marital sexual satisfaction was significantly and hugely significantly better. The marital sexual satisfaction improved. That was amazing to me. See, for a lot of people, they think it's no big deal. I'm telling you, it's a big deal. And the reason for that is there's a contrast effect in psychology. Same goes with the contrast effect with recreational companionship. If I enjoy spending more time with net going out and doing things, and, then, and, and it's more fun to be with her than to be with my husband, there's a contrast effect. I'm going to be wanting to spend time with her. See, that's why I want you to be each other's favorite recreational companion. The same thing as I want there to be no contrast effect with sexual fulfillment. So do you guys get that? The, so the research says that even if you've had a past, even doesn't matter what year you started, is that there's hope that if you stop it within a month, you're going to have the sexual satisfaction back, or at least it's going to be increasing. I give this to you from the heart, and I'm always a truth teller, and this is a huge deal. Sexual satisfaction is in the marriage, and that's where it needs to stay for the best quality. The need for intimate conversation. Now, this isn't about talking about sex in conversation. Intimate conversation is a craving for sharing feelings and discussing topics of personal interest and opinion and making plans in a way that expresses extraordinary care. The friends of good conversation get to know or inform and understand. Yes, questions. By the way, there's a really great, um, there's a lot of great apps out there to ask questions. I haven't been promoting these too much, but the Forgiveness of Love has like seven apps, mobile apps. One is called E2, Engage and Explore. And there are a bunch of pictures where you just look at the pictures, and many of them our daughter took from the Philippines. So there's some really interesting pictures in there. And then it has questions that you as a couple can talk about to get to know deeper each other and their, their, their thoughts. And so intimate conversation is doing something like that. You're sitting at the table. And so even today, if you're wondering, well, what should we do? Well, download E2. It's called E2, Engage and Explore. You can see that all with a QR code in the mobile apps at the end. And so that's part of intimate conversation. It's developing an interest in each other's favorite topics. Hmm, what are your favorite topics? I'd love it if we talk about blank. I'd love it if you would look at the news and come up with three things that are happening in the news, if that's what you like. Balance the conversation. Are there any introverts here in this hall? Who would be called an introvert? How many of you? Raise your hand. Introverts. I am an introvert. 
You may not think that, but I am. I love being in my own house alone, and I don't have to see anybody for four days, if possible. But here's the problem with intimate conversation when you have an introvert, extrovert team. Who likes to do the talking? The extrovert. If you truly want a balanced conversation, sometimes I'll recommend, if you're the extrovert, pause and wait for about a minute, maybe 30 seconds, before you speak. And I'll guarantee you, within that 30 seconds, your introvert spouse will speak. And you'll have better intimate conversation. All right? All right. Thought I'd help you, my fellow introverts. Now, what are some enemies of intimate conversation? Well, we call these love busters. Basically, they're making demands. They're trying to force an agreement, use conversation to punish, and dwell on mistakes of the past and the present. I tell you, the best way to ruin a really good intimate conversation is to bring up, do you remember that time? When you did that, I just thought about it. And I have a need to just talk about it, how I felt about what you did 10 years ago. When I'm talking with Phil, when we were driving up to Tai, I was starting to talk about kind of a business mistake, and it was in my head. I had to stop it. It was my choice. I had to. Fortunately, Phil told me, also, I'd love it if we talk about another topic, and then all of a sudden I realized, oh, duh, you know, I, I know this stuff. And this is why I'm telling you guys, we all need reviews. All right, the need for recreational companionship, craving for leisure activities with at least one other person. Helps deposit love units into each other's love banks almost effortlessly. Unlikely that you would even stay in love if you do not find time to spend together for recreational companionship. Do you have mutual, enjoyable recreational interests? There are thousands of activities you would enjoy if you knew about them, and hundreds of them that you would enjoy together. Part of the class is we have a recreational companionship or recreational activity inventory. And so we have people identify activities that would be Good for both of them. All four of these emotional needs must be met in a romantic relationship. These four are the biggies. But it takes time to meet these needs. What's interesting about domestic support, you don't have to be with the person to meet that need, do you? For even Financial support, you don't necessarily have to be with the person to meet that need. But these four, you have to be with them. It takes time. It takes time. So, there's a rule that we have. It involves three things. Privacy. Now, whoa, this is a hard sell sometimes. Undivided attention is necessary to meet emotional, intimate emotional needs. Think about it, right? Affection, sexual fulfillment, intimate conversation, and recreational companionship. It needs time. Within your date time or within your 15 hours, these four needs are going to be your priority. However you decide to do them in their, those 15 hours, they're a priority. Now, speaking of apps, we have a gift of time app. You guys can actually start it today because you're going to be spending some time with each other, right? This afternoon and this evening. Now, you can't count the time with your, when you're with other people, but you can start documenting the time. And it's going to ask you, it's going to say, were these needs met? And how much time? And you're going to be able to calculate it. You're even going to have a graph. All right? So recommend that. Now, amount. 
How many hours for you graduates? 15 hours. A month? A week. It's most likely a lot of you who have not taken the class are not at that 15 hours. But the class helps you learn how to do that. So don't worry about it. Now, does anyone want to ask me this question? Why 15 hours? Should we just do a quick Q&A here? Why do we come up with 15 hours? Why not 10? Let me give you a couple explanations. Let's say you only had five hours a week. And let's say a husband has a need for sexual fulfillment and recreational companionship. And the wife has a need for affection and intimate conversation. Let's just say. How are they going to divide five hours of time together? They're going to be grabbing for it. But at 15 hours, there's enough time to get all of those four needs very well done. Not only that, there's another reason. How much time did you spend when you were dating? Do we have any newlyweds here? Newlyweds? Do you mind if I ask you a question? How much time do you think you spent every day, for example, you know, texting, talking, doing stuff, or how much time during the week about? At least three hours a day, right? Doesn't take much to do the math on that one, over 15 hours. And a lot of you would probably say more. We couldn't, get the, they, we couldn't get the phone down. But you see, in order to get into feeling of love, in order to make enough love unit deposits, you have to have time. In order to stay in love, you have to have time. Okay. If you haven't learned how to do that, again, take the class. It's going to help you do that. How to keep anything from threatening your love. I'm going to give you an example. Every Sunday afternoon at 3.30, for example, schedule your 15 hours together for the upcoming week. Schedule it. Why is scheduling so strange in marriage? We do it in every other part of our lives, right? That's important. Bible study, church, whatever, Bible reading, we're scheduling it. I'm saying this is your most important human relationship. Schedule time. So today, if you want to have a takeaway, go to your rooms, figure out your schedule for the week. When are you going to get some time together? Now, again, you're not going to be experts at hitting the mark yet because you haven't gone through the I love it ifs and everything, and you don't even know what your needs are yet. But those that do, schedule if you haven't done it yet. Document the time you spend meeting each other's intimate emotional needs. Like I said, use the Gift of Time app. It's free. Hold each other accountable. Do not let anything keep you from spending that time together. And one more sales pitch. Take the Four Gifts of Love class. Can I just say something? Someone would say, 15 hours with her? Or 15 hours with him? Holy cow. I can't even do an hour. Here's the secret. The 15 hours is fun time. Don't discuss anything that's going to cause any disruption. Make it fun. I look forward to those times with Jennifer. I'm busy at work, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be home. I'm going to spend that time. Make that time something that's enjoyable that you do, okay? Always make it fun, okay? Now, next session, tomorrow morning, we're going to be talking about protection. And that's going to be also important for your time together. So I don't say you have to be spending the 15 hours now or doing that because you also have to learn how to protect. You have to know how to do it. Your homework assignment until tomorrow morning. What's the phrase? 
What can I do to make deposits and avoid withdrawals? Me, right? And if you want, be careful with it. There's a warning. You don't want to overdo it. You can start practicing I'd love it if, I love it whens, especially. The I love it whens are like giving admiration, right? I love it when you do that or do da da da. So you can start giving those if you'd like. But then just be careful that you're not doing 20 in an hour type of thing. And then download the gift of honesty. Oh, we have a gift of honesty app. I didn't mention that one, did I? It helps you do I'd love it ifs. And it helps you do a one to five scale. So download these apps, please. And enjoy the rest of your day. And we will see you tomorrow morning. But thank you for your attention. Thank you. All right.